Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. So today, we're going to continue talking about objects, and we're going to introduce one of the more important features about how we work with objects in Java, which is inheritance. First, I want to say I suspect that there are, you know, more than a few people from the Chicago area here. Um, like you, I was up late last night watching the Cubs lose, um, sadly. Um, it's a pretty good game, though. I'm not a Cubs fan. I was a Red Sox fan for a long time, and at some point I sort of lost interest in baseball, but I did enjoy watching last night's game. Um, one of the things I'll point out, since Obviously, if I talk about something like this in class, I have to relate it to computer science or this course in some way. Um, is that, you know, when you're a fan of a team, like I used to be a fan of the Red Sox, I'm still a fan of the Patriots, when your team wins, like deep in the back of your mind, hopefully because you're a decent human being, you're aware of the fact that somebody else lost. Like some other team, some other city, some other group of fans is, is upset because your team won. You're happy, they're sad. Somehow this all cancels out in the universe. But one of the nice things about teaching, about a course like this, is this is not a zero-sum game. And I want you guys to remember that, particularly when we think about grading. So there's not some limited number of A grades that you are all competing for. Uh, there's an unlimited number of A grades that I would love all of you to earn by the end of the semester. Okay, public service announcement over. Uh, unfortunately, we won't get a chance to watch the Cups anymore for the rest of the postseason. So, Today, let's go back and talk about static again. I just want to make sure that we're firm on this concept. We're going to give you more practice through the homework problems. Um, but again, if you understand static, you understand how static differs, how static methods and variables differ from instance methods and variables, you've come to a point in your understanding of Java objects. There's, there's something about Java objects that you now understand. All right? So, so instance variables and methods belong to each instance of the object. Every instance of a Java object has its own instance variables. And those instance methods that you declare have access to that state. So in order to run an instance method, I need an instance of the object. I can't call split until I have a string, or trim until I have a string. Static variables, on the other hand, are defined, and you can think of them as belonging to the class. So I don't need an instance to use them. I can call them by just using the class name directly. And they don't have access to any instance state, unless you provide it to them explicitly, because you don't need an instance to use them. So there are some examples you know, we can, we can show this in the playground a little bit. This is sort of how you do library methods in Java. So in Java, everything is an object. And this is gonna become more clear as we talk about inheritance. So except for those seven primitive types, everything else you use in Java is an object. And everything sort of, one of the things that's a little bit frustrating about Java is they make a lot of efforts to sort of cram everything into this, into this object model. So I can't just, other languages I can just like, have a library that I import that has functions defined on it. In Java, I have to have an object, class. And so, the way I define library type routines is by creating a class and setting them up as static methods. You guys may have seen this. There's a math class that you can use. It's part of the Java standard library that has <laughs> methods like computing the absolute value, things like this. These are static methods. I'll show you, we can show you an example of that in a minute. Okay. So I can have both static methods and static variables. Static methods, I don't need an instance of the object to use them, but if I have an instance of the object, I can still call them. They don't have access to the state of the, any instance of the object because they can be called without an instance. And so I can't use, some of you guys are discovering on the homework problems, I can't use this inside a static method, nor can I refer to variables without using this that are instance variables. So I don't have an instance. I don't have to have an instance. Okay. All right, just said this. Great. And static variables, because they're defined on the class, there's only one, you know, one copy of them anywhere, and so they're shared by all instances of the class. 
So every instance in this case has access to this static variable count and can read it, can write it, you know, depending on the uh, visibility modifiers I've attached to count. In this case, I've made it public, so anybody can modify it, including instances of that class. Okay. Public and private modify static methods and static variables in a way that's very familiar to us or is starting to become familiar to you. So if I mark a static method as public or a static variable as public, then anybody can read or write it. If I mark a static variable as private, it can only be modified by methods defined on that class. Same thing with uh, static methods. So a public static method can be called by anybody. A private static method can only be called by other methods defined on that class. All right, I think I'm done with static. Right. Ah, okay, so, so here's one possible use for static methods. It's a lot of uses for static methods. Again, providing sort of utility routines that don't make sense, that don't need an object instance is one of the common uses of static methods. But I can also use static methods to create objects in ways that allow me to reject bad parameters. So when we talked about object constructors, we pointed out that in Java, one of the limitations of object constructors is that they can't fail. They always return a new instance of the object. So if you pass them invalid parameters, they still have to return an instance. They can't fail, they can't return null, or basically say you, you messed up. A static method, on the other hand, can. It's just another function, so it can return an instance of the object or null if this fails. So we'll do an example in a minute where we use a static method to combine with a private constructor. So that's kind of cool. A constructor doesn't have to be public. I can create a private constructor, use a public static method, and then now I have a better way of rejecting uh, bad attempts to create instances of a class. All right, so let's do an example of this. So um, in the last class, we started talking about this example of like a storage class. So this is a class that's defined to store a certain number of integers. You might wonder, why am I doing this? Why not just use an array of integers? And this is an but this is an example we'll come back to when we talk, start to talk about more interesting data structures. So as we know, one of the limitations of Java arrays is that I can't resize them as the program is running. So if I run out of elements in my array, I'm stuck. I can create a new array and copy things over. It's a little bit messy. But there are Java classes, some of you are familiar with them and using them on some of the MPs and on the homework, that do allow me to create resizable arrays. And one of the things we'll do in a couple weeks is we'll actually implement a little bit of one of those together to just give you a sense of how that works internally. All right, so maybe this is our starting point. So I have a, a public class called storage. And remember, the problem here was that if I create a public constructor, and ask people to provide a size when they create a new instance of a storage object, what do I do if somebody gets me a negative size or a zero? It's the point of having an empty storage class. So it's not clear here what to do if set size is invalid. It's a sort of a general pattern that you're gonna see which is, what do I do in a constructor if somebody provided me with bogus arguments? And again, we'll talk maybe Friday, maybe Monday, about another way of handling this situation. It uses Java's built-in uh, error and exception uh, mechanisms. So right now, I really don't have anything to do here. I could, wh what are some things I could do? Let's say somebody gives me a negative value. Uh, how could I handle that? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so the, the response was I could print something. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, remember a lot of times there's no console attached to your program. So there's nobody actually looking at the output here. Um, but, you know, I could essentially, you know, when we talk about errors, I could generate an error that said, essentially, you, you created an invalid request. Um, what else? What's another way of, of handling this? I try to create a storage object with size negative five. What else could I do? Try to, and it, yeah. Yeah, I could just like create a storage object with some default size. I could say there's a default size that 
I use if you provide me with an invalid input of like 16 or something, some nice computer science number like 16 or 32 or 8, power of 2. And I just, you know, if you don't give me a good number, I just create it with, um, with this default value. Both of these solutions are sort of unsatisfying, right? Because on some level, someone did something wrong, and we want to indicate to them that that's what happened. Okay? So let's try something different. So let's create a static method. I'm gonna mark this as public. I'm gonna mark it as static. No! All right, who's streaming a soccer match in here? Please stop it. All right, come on, Chromecast. I knew this was gonna happen one day. Never know what day it's gonna be. All right. Bear with me for a minute. Let's try rebooting this guy. Generated like a surprising level of panic in the audience. It's like, oh, the projector stopped working. Technically, we don't need a projector. So you guys can just follow along in your seats. Let me see if I can get this to work again. All right. I think we're back, good. Oh, nope, not so much. Okay, well, that's our backup plan. I have to stand over here and feel weird. Um, okay, so back to our example. So instead of, you know, having a public storage constructor, which I'm gonna rewrite here, and you know, our question was, what do I do if set size is invalid? Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a static public, I think these are backwards, I think I need to do public, static. So what is this method going to return? What does a constructor return on some level? It doesn't return anything, but what does it return? Hmm? Void. No, it doesn't, it doesn't really return void. You don't have to, um, so this is a good question. In the constructor, you don't actually have to return anything explicitly, but what does the function return implicitly? A new instance of that 
kind of object. So what is my static method here going to return? This is, so you guys have seen this before. I think it's, it's confused some of you recently. I'm gonna return an instance of type storage. So now I have to do this because this is not a constructor, right? I'm gonna call this create, and I'm gonna have it take the same arguments as my constructor. Wait, does this make sense? This is just a typical function declaration. I've got my return type, which in this case is an instance of the storage class, and I've got, you know, my modifiers. This is public, anybody can use it, and it's static. I don't need an instance to call it, and of course, this is important for this pattern because if I needed an instance to call it, it wouldn't be very useful because where does that instance come from? Now I have a sort of a chicken and the egg problem. All right. So here what I can do is I can say if set size is less than or equal to zero, return null. Otherwise, return new storage set size. So whenever I create a new object in Java, I always have to call the constructor somewhere. Every time, except for strings, where I can initialize them with the literal. But for every other type of object in Java, there is a new statement somewhere. Now, you don't necessarily see it as a programmer, and you particularly don't see it if I mark this guy as private. So let's do the right thing with my, I'm gonna say my storage is equal to new int set size. So I'm initializing my array of integers here to be the requested size, and I'm done. So now let's see what happens if I say storage is equal to new storage. Let's give it a valid argument. What's going to happen here? So I'm, you know, we've, we've done this before. I'm creating a new instance of the object. Is this going to work? Why not? because I marked the constructor as private. So this is the use case for private constructors. I can force you, oop, that's, there's other problems here. So it says no applicable constructor. Why? I mean, my method signature matches one of the constructors, but it's marked as private. If I change that, if I remove the private keyword here, then I'm okay. But what I'm doing here is I'm forcing you to use my create method. So how do I create new instances of storage objects? I say storage.create, and then I give the size. And then let's just print this guy. And let's do this. Let's do public int size. And we'll say size is equal to set size, just so that I can print this off. Size. Pull this down a little bit so you guys can see all of the code. So this combines a couple of things we've talked about so far. We have visibility modifiers, we have static, we have a constructor. For the first time, I've marked as private questions at this point before we go on. If you're confused, now is the time to ask because things are about to get more interesting in a couple of slides. Any questions about static instance methods, variables? Again, we're gonna give you more practice with this. Through the homework problems, obviously on MP3, definitely through the homework problems. So and we're gonna feed you a steady diet of, you know, small little class design examples for the next week or so. Okay. So now, well, okay, let me, let me briefly, because you know, I'm obligated to talk about all of the different Java keywords that you might see. Let me just briefly discuss final. It's not really something that we need to talk about for a long period of time. So a final variable in Java cannot be modified after it's initialized. So in this example you see on line three, probably one of the most common uses of final, which is to create a constant value that's associated with a particular instance, a particular class, sorry. So this is static. 
So now you'll see I've got three of these Java keywords attached to this variable. The type of the variable is int. It's hanging out way over there on the right. But this is also public, static, and final. What does that mean? It's public. Anybody can read it. Not write it in this case, because it's final, but read it. It's static, meaning that it's attached to the class. I don't need an instance to access this particular variable, which is normally the case when I have a constant like this, because, you know, I'll just attach it to the, to the class, and then everybody can use it. And final. So once I have set this value, it cannot be changed. Check style and our general rule of thumb we program in this class is going to force you to use a specific naming convention for these types of variables, which is all caps. So instead of using camel case, we do all caps, and we use underscores to just separate out the, the pieces, um, right? So you'll, you'll see this in a lot of places. There's a lot of places where we have meaningful numbers that we want to give semantic meaning. This is also the reason you get magic number errors with check style, because nobody wants to see, like, 61 hanging out in your code. Somebody wants to see a symbolic constant that makes sense, right? So you have to explain to somebody, you know, instead of using, like, nine all over the place, if that's how many hours of sleep you think people should get, you define hours of sleep, you set it to nine, and then you use this constant throughout your code. It makes it much, much more readable. Final has some other uses, too, that we'll talk about a little bit later. But for now, you can think of the primary use of final as allowing us to create constant values in Java. All right, so, yeah, and, and here you can see that I, I can't change, I can't change the value, right? So I try to, I set it initially, I try to set it again, it's not going to change. I'm not even sure this will compile if you try it using IntelliJ. Okay. Questions about this stuff, again, before we introduce a new set of ideas. Mm-hmm. Yep. Ah, where, on which line? Ah, so you want to go through the, the create method. Yeah, so this is a static method defined on a class. It returns an instance of type storage, but it can also return null which is something the constructor can't do. So what we do is lines five through seven, and we check the size that you provided. If you provided a bad size, I'm gonna give you back null. Right, so I'm not gonna hand you back an instance of a storage option. Actually, yeah, we should have done this. Yeah, so now you'll see I've got a null reference. A constructor can't do this, right? The constructor always has to hand back a new instance, right? Even if it's left in some sort of, you know, uh, unfortunate state. So here what I'm doing is I'm calling the constructor. Why can I do this? The constructor is marked as private, but this method is defined on the same class. So it's allowed to call the constructor. Whenever I create an instance of an object in Java, I always have to use new. Again, sometimes you don't see the new keyword. So you'll work with classes, with packages, where instead of a constructor, they'll have a create method like this that you have to call. It's a static method. It will hand you back an instance of that object but you'll never call new. So you'll see down here in my code, so you can imagine that this is some piece of code somebody else wrote that you're using in the code that we have down here uh, in, our, in our main method that's running when I run this example. There's no call to new, right? I call this static method that's defined on the class. Does that make sense? Cool, good question. Okay. Other questions before we move on? Pause. Here for a moment. Okay. So, let me uh, pose a puzzle for you guys. Why does this piece of code work? So what am I doing here? I've got, I am really lost with this over here. It's freaking me out. Um, I've got an example class. I created my main method. This is where our examples are starting now. And I create a new instance of example, so that's okay. I've, I've defined the example class right here. But then I'm calling this method. 
called toString. This will work, by the way. You can run it. It doesn't print out something particularly interesting, but why does this work? Or let me ask a different question. What's curious about this? Based on what you know so far about Java objects, what about this doesn't make sense? There's something, there's a glitch in the matrix. Who can spot it? Yeah. Yeah, where is toString defined? I'm calling a method called toString on my new instance of the example object, but does anyone see a definition of toString here? No. Where is it? Why does this work? Yeah. Yep. Ah, okay, another good question. What happens if I don't define a constructor? Another good question, actually. Yeah, in the back, green shirt. What happens if I don't define a constructor? So there's a default constructor that gets run that doesn't do any initialization. So for example, let's see what that means. This is a good chance to review. I don't have to provide a constructor for my objects. Let's see, let's put a string on this guy. Okay, and now let's print, and let's make this public. Put example.name. What's this gonna print? No. I didn't, I didn't initialize. So I can create objects without providing a constructor. There's a default constructor that gets run. But again, I, there's this two string method that's hanging out that's kind of freaking me out here. I can call this two string method, and it returns a string, it's printing something. Why? So, one of the distinctive and important features of Java's object model is something called inheritance. Java not only allows me to define classes, it allows me to create relationships between those classes in an extremely well-defined way. So when I create a new class in Java, I am allowed to inherit functionality from another class. So here's an example of this. I have a, from starting on line one, I've defined a class called pet. And pet has a couple of instance variables. It has a name and a type. And there's this new keyword hanging out there called protected that we're gonna talk about in a minute. It also defines an instance method called print me that prints, you know, that instance to the console. Now, on line nine, there's some new syntax for us to look at. So, public class dog, that's the definition, so I'm defining a new class here, and the class definition looks fairly similar to what I've seen before, but extends pet. So that's the new bit here. So the way I do this in Java, the way I establish these relationships, is using the extends keyword. And this code down here on the bottom is going to work. Why? Dog doesn't directly define a print me method, but it inherits a print me method from its superclass or from its parent in this case. You'll also notice that dog doesn't define instance variables called name and type, but it sets them in the constructor. This is because these variables are inherited from its parent class pet. So the way I do this in Java is through this new keyword called extends. When a class extends another class, it indicates that it is inheriting the behavior from that class. So when I extend an object in Java, I inherit both its state and behavior, both its data, the instance variables, and its algorithms and also any static content as well. So it's like I, I took one blueprint and I sort of added another piece to it. 
take all that existing stuff. I'm still going to use that to set up the class, but I am allowed to define new things. I can have multiple levels of inheritance, and I can have multiple classes that inherit from one parent class. What we'll start to see is that the inheritance relationships among Java objects form a data structure that's known as a tree, where there's one root, an important class we're going to talk about today or in a few slides, or maybe soon, and then there's this whole structure below it. So for example, in this case, on line one, I declare a class called pet, and then on lines two and three, I declare two classes, dog and cat, that both inherit from pet. They both extend pet. So dog extends pet, it's gonna inherit state and behavior from pet. Cat also extends pet, so it's gonna also extend, uh, inherit pet's state and behavior. When we talk about classes in Java, we sometimes use terminology that's sort of related to like a family tree. The only difference, of course, is that in Java, every class only has one parent as opposed to two. But we refer to, sometimes refer to a class's immediate ancestor, the class that it extends as its parent. We sometimes refer to classes that extend a particular class as children. So in this case, both dog and cat extend pet. They are pet's children. For both dog and cat, pet is their parent class. Every class, except one in Java, has a parent, including all of the classes that we've defined so far, despite the fact that we've never used the extends keyword. This is an important feature of Java's object model. We'll talk about why this works in a minute. So we've never used extends, but every class in Java has a parent, and many classes in Java, although not all of them, have one or sometimes many children, classes that inherit from them. Do I hear a question? Yeah. No, not every class has children. Every class has a parent. Not every class has children. Some classes have children, some don't. Yeah, that's a good, important distinction. Yeah. No. No, no, in f and in fact, this, the fact that we can do this is a feature of this environment that we use in, in class. If you try to do this in IntelliJ, you'll get all sorts of errors. Normally, Java insists that each class live in its own file, right? So if I want to create a class called dog that lives in dog.java, I want to create a class called cat that lives in cat.java. You've been, so this is a great question. You've been using all sorts of functionality from Java already that you've never seen, right? Most of it lives in files that you will never, ever open. All right, good, good great questions. Inheritance, as you might expect, can in extend to multiple levels. So in this class, I've got, in this example, I have a class called pet. Then I declare a class called dog that extends pet. So pet is dog's parent, and pet now has one child that I can see here, which is dog. And then I create another class called mutt, and I declare that that class extends dog. So now mutt is dog's child, and dog is mutt's parent. So I have two levels of inheritance. Once inheritance starts to span multiple levels, we start to use different keywords. Let me also make sure you understand how this works. So a class inherits all of the state and behavior of all of its ancestors. So dog extends pet, so dog inherits pet's behavior and state. Mutt extends dog, so mutt gets all of dog's state and behavior and all of pet's state and behavior. It's one of those lectures where I just have to concentrate really hard. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. So, so why do we do this, right? So, so um, Jeremy's question was, can dog have instance variables and methods that pet does, doesn't have? Yes, that's the exact reason that we typically do this. We will talk more about how we organize state and behavior using this model. 
But what happens is, what, the reason that we extend another class is we want to add things to it, typically. We want to take a class like pet, and a dog says, you know, I mean, I know every pet has a name, but dogs also have a breed, you know, you know, not every pet barks, you know, not every pet sleeps for like, you know, 18 hours a day. Um, you know, so dogs have their own behavior that not every pet shares. Right? So we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute when we talk a little bit about how this plays a role in object design. It's a great question. Again, we can continue using this family tree type terminology to discuss how these classes are related to each other. So pet and dog are both Mutt's ancestors. Mutt's direct parent is dog, but Mutt also has pet as an ancestor. And both dog and Matt, blue, both dog and Mutt are Pet's descendants. Dog is Pet's direct child, but Mutt is also a descendant of Pet. So Mutt will have all the state and behavior that Pet has, and extra stuff that it picked up from Dog. Okay, let me see, I lost my, okay, I'm doing good on time. So now that we've started to introduce inheritance, we can actually talk about one of the other Java visibility modifiers that we hadn't talked about until now because it doesn't make any sense until we talk about inheritance. So this protected keyword. In our code, you're not gonna see this a lot. This is actually something that we're, you, we're not gonna require that you use very much. We might have some homework problems just familiarizing you with this idea. So remember, public instance variables, anybody can modify. Anybody can read, anybody can write. Private instance variables or static variables can only be read or written by methods on that class. And normally what I do is I provide getters and setters for those. Protected values are different. A protected value can't be read or written by anybody, but it can be read or written by descendants of that class, any descendant. So if I extend another class, I can modify its public variables, so can anybody else. I can't modify its private variables, those are still private to that class. Nobody else can modify them. But I can also modify its protected variables. And as you would expect, this applies to methods as well. And so this allows me to do things like this. So my dog constructor, if I marked type as private, nobody else can modify it, and so this constructor wouldn't be able to work. But because I marked it as protected, when, dog, when the dog constructor runs, when I create new instances of dog, it can set the type of its parent class, one of its ancestors in this case, pet. There's another way to do this as well that I'll show you in a minute. Okay. All right, so let's do a little example of this. So I have a class called dog that I've defined at the top with two protected instance variables, meaning that not everybody could read and write them, but my descendants can read and write them. My children and any of my children's children. Any of my children's children's children, all my descendants. Public class dog extends pet, so it's inheriting state and behavior from pet. It gets the instance variable name, it gets the instance variable type. And it sets those in its constructor. We can use, modify this a little bit. I don't, of course I don't need to use this, I can also do this. Hmm, I can type. There you go. So let's walk through what happens. Here, when the code in my main method runs, starting at line 16, I create a new dog called Choo Choo, a new instance variable of a dog called Choo Choo, and I create it by running the dog constructor. So the dog constructor runs, it sets the name of the class to the past parameter, and it sets the type to dog. That's hard-coded here, because every instance of type dog is a dog. So I can set the type that my parent class wants me to set. 
And then I call this print me method. So again, print me is not defined. Dog here does not define print me. It doesn't define name or type. Those are all things it's inherited. Those are state and behavior that it is inherited from its parent. In this case is pet. Okay. So one of the reasons we don't talk about protected very much in this class is that it doesn't really always do exactly what you think it would. It's a, it's a little confusing to, to use properly. Okay? So this code I'm showing you right now will work. Now you may think he just lied to us again. He keeps doing that. Right, so why shouldn't this work? Let's think about it. So I've got a class called pet. I have a class called dog that extends pet. So dog is pet's child, the descendant of pet. I have a protected variable called name, and my dog instructor sets the name, so that's okay. That's all kosh, that's gonna work. But what about line 12? It doesn't seem like it should work, but it will. Why shouldn't it work? Because example doesn't inherit from dog. So example shouldn't be able to set, you know, instance variables on the dog class. It doesn't make any, it's just, it's just weird. So it turns out that protected, again, works a little bit differently than you might want it to. So a protected variable can be read or written by methods defined on that class or its descendants in any package. So there's a, there's a packaging, um, thing here. So the, the problem, the reason this works is because when I run this code, and we don't, I haven't told you about packages yet, so we're gonna have to come back and talk about this later. But all of these classes are in the same package. And protected actually allows any class in the same package to modify that variable. So when this runs, Java says, okay, example is in the same package as pet and dog, even though it doesn't descend from it directly, and I'm, so I'm gonna let it modify that variable. So again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trouble yourself over this. When you start writing, now this does become useful when you start writing code that other people are going to use. Because when you do that, you create the package. And so by marking something as protected, what you're saying is that you, this other random person that I don't know who's using my code, you can modify this variable. Inside my package, anybody can modify the variable, and that's usually okay because I wrote all the code inside the package. But if you want to extend, you want to take my code and do something new with it, you want to, uh, you can modify this variable. Okay, anyway. So, so let's review. Just before we go on, our visibility modifier is a public, anybody can modify it anywhere. Private, only read or written by methods on that class. Protected, can be read or written by methods on that class. And it's descendants in any package or any class in the same package. Ugh. I don't know why they made this so confusing. Methods, same thing. Public, anybody can call it. Private, only other methods on that same class. The descendants cannot call it. I just wanna make sure that's clear, because that's an important thing to realize. Protected any descendant in any package or any other class in the same package. All right, we are almost done. So, what we saw, let me go back and show you this example that we did before. Well, actually, it's right here. You know, we, how, do, how do we do this last time? So here's what we did last time. You know, that was, that was the broken example. Here we go. So here was the example that we were talking about a minute ago. I have a class called dog that extends pet. It inherits the name and type, those instance variables from pet. It also inherits a method called print me. When the constructor runs, it sets the name and the type that it inherited from pet. And this is, you know, this will work. It's also possible for Java classes to call their parents constructor. So, and this kind of makes sense, right? In the sense that a lot of times, what happens when I extend a class is I add some new features to it, and when my constructor runs, what I wanna do is I wanna 
I want to take responsibility for initializing whatever I need to support those new features. So I might have added some of my own instance variables that I need to initialize. But then at some point, essentially what I want to do is I want to kind of go to my parent and be like, okay, I'm done setting up my new pieces. You go ahead and do whatever it is you need to do to finish setting up your part of the object. And so I can do this using the keyword called super. So super runs my parent's constructor. And like every other call to a constructor, it has to match a constructor provided by my parent. Now, the parent might provide several constructors if they're overloaded, but the signature of super has to match one of them. There's all, also a rule here, which is it has to be the first thing that gets done in the child. So I can't do some other work in my constructor and then call super. If I'm gonna use super, and I don't have to, it's the first line in the child constructor. So in this case, what I've done is I've said, you know what? I don't want every instance, every class that extends pet to have to set the type. I'll just provide a constructor for pet that sets the type proper. And I could do my own validation in here. I could say, you know, the type has to be one of these following types or whatever. It can't be null. You know, I could check various things. My dog class now, in order to, you know, create a pet parent, has to call the constructor. It has to be the first thing it does. So rather than setting the type itself, it calls the superclass constructor using super. So when the dog constructor runs on line nine, the first thing it's gonna do is run super with a single string argument. Java's gonna start running the pet constructor on line three. That's gonna set the type of this pet object to the pass parameter. Then I'm gonna continue down here, and then I'm gonna set the breed to whatever it is that you passed. Again, this is a common pattern for, you know, initializing multiple levels of object inheritance. Yeah. Okay, so, so the question is, can I use super to access the constructor of one of my ancestors? No. But super may result in your ancestor's constructor being called, right? Because it's possible that pet inherits from something else, and so it's possible that pet calls super, right? So if I have a case where I have several levels of inheritance, it's possible that when I create an object way down at the bottom of that tree, it calls super, its parent calls super, its parent calls super, its parent calls super, and there's initialization or construction that's being done on multiple levels, yeah. But there's no way to, like, jump up a level, and that's actually important. Um, okay, so here's an example of this. You can see now I'm using the super class constructor. One thing to note here is that, let me do this, I have to call a constructor that's defined by my parent. So here I changed the type signature or the method signature of my constructor to take both a string and an int, and now if I wanted to call it, the child would have to call it with a proper argument. I think, well, let me, let me cover this and then we'll be done. So as I said before, the Java object model is designed to allow you to organize things, and that organization um, is into something that we're gonna talk about a lot more in this class later as a data structure. This is something called a tree. So a tree in computer science consists of a series of objects uh, with a very specific set of relationships between them. And the trees we're gonna talk about in this class, every object has one ancestor, one parent, and these objects don't have to be Java classes. They can be other things. We'll talk later about using trees to store a variety of different types of information because, like many other data structures, they allow us to run some really cool algorithms. And this is something that you'll go on and learn more about when you take 225. So here's an example. So, you know, the question is, why has Java chosen this particular model? And there's a, there's a deeper, more interesting answer that we're gonna talk about later. It has to do with how the type system works and various types of guarantees that this allows Java to provide. But this also, on some level, in many cases, matches up with 
how we organize things in the real world. So, you know, there's a taxonomy of creatures on this planet that biologists and, I guess, zoologists have established over multiple decades, where every creature has, you know, descends from something. There's basically a huge tree that I work my way up, right, that is sort of designed to express something about how the natural world is organized. Um, so, so here's a small piece of this, right, in the sense, and this is not, you know, a, a zoologically correct taxonomy, um, but, you know, I have four different types of mammal, and then I have a couple different types of dog and different types of horse. Dog breeds are actually not separate species, I don't think. So this hierarchical structure can be a natural reflection of how things are organized in the real world. It also is another one of these organizational principles for reusing logic in our programs. We're gonna talk about this on Friday, where we'll do some examples of, of how to solve problems using Java objects and Java inheritance. But in a lot of cases, if I'm clever, what I can do is I can set up my object model so that common functionality is inherited from a particular class, and then that class's children add the little pieces that are distinct. And so, rather than having to duplicate a lot of code, I inherit a lot of code and features from my parent, and I do a little bit of customization in each child. All right, we'll come back and talk about that on Friday. I think I'm pretty much done here. All I have to say today is MP3 is out. Please get started on it. It's not an easy MP. It's not droppable. It's due in less than two weeks. I will see you guys on Friday.